Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that change the world and change us. Don't forget, if you enjoy our work, please give us a rating, a comment, maybe both with your podcast provider. Also, share an episode with a friend. That's the only way we grow. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our fourth episode exploring the Shakespearean world of Romeo and Juliet. In week one, we met our author, William Shakespeare, and introduced the play through the iconic sonnet that sets the scene. In week two, we explored the political world of Verona. We met our feuding families and introduced the uh, star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet, and ending by reading the beautiful words spoken to and from that glorious balcony where lovers to this day still come as pilgrims. Um, however, last week, Christy tried to destroy all of our <laughs> fantasies of love at first sight and, and passionate adolescence by... By introducing an alternate reading of this famous passage and presenting a theory that Juliet is a young adult exerting power on the universe and changing a fate prescribed uh, to her by her parents. And it's not that she's not in love with Romeo, or so you propose. Uh, it's that love is secondary to self-preservation, or at least aligned with it. Uh, and Romeo is an extremely good-looking young man, emphasis being that he's her own age. and <laughs> That helps. She's facing the prospect of life with an old geezer. And uh, However, we didn't end there. We, uh, we ended our discussion with life in Verona taking a darker turn. There's a street fight that got out of control. Two people are dead. Mercutio and Tybalt. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, although technically married, have a huge problem. Romeo is the murderer. Never good. The prince, uh, in an effort to be merciful, has banished him from Verona, uh, and he's basically on the run. So we've left our story with our heroine in a tizzy. Uh, she wavers, perhaps for a minute, but quickly decides that she's staying with Romeo. And oh, yeah. The nurse has promised to bring him up to her room for one last night of passion, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> we are now waiting to see what happens next. Yes, and that's where we're at, ready to pick up our story in the flat middle, slightly past the climax, because that's the murders. Uh, and there is so much to stay. In fact, so much so, I really get overwhelmed thinking about what I should do because I don't want to just talk and talk and talk but still I never feel like I'm doing justice to the text. Well that's okay there <laughs> there are literally millions of people who have been studying Shakespeare's text and trying to come to terms with it. I know there's hundreds yes of years and let me just give you a taste of what we're talking about. That's some fun facts. So one of the things that Shakespeare made a big deal about and, and we've made a big deal about it too is the fact that Juliet is so young, between 13 and 14. Well, you know who else is young? William Shakespeare, when he writes the play. And this is one of his earlier plays. And this, of course, is just me hypothesizing, maybe running in my mouth. But I think it is kind of funny, because I think he's showing off a little bit here. By the time you get to Hamlet, he's much more subdued and much more serious. But this is what I mean by showing off. Let's go back to Juliet's age. So Shakespeare is clearly making her way too young so that no one can miss the fact that she's supposed to be married. Not even her father. Capulet tells Paris that she, um, she is too soon marred are those so early made. Meaning you get messed up if you get married that early, Paris. <laughs> but Shakespeare is going to play around with this number 14, 13 to 14, for the rest of the play. Because number symbolism was a really popular thing to do at the time. So, look at all these weird things. Juliet's name has 13 letters. She's the 13th character to enter the stage. Romeo refers to her by name 14 times. There are 13 proper names on the Capulet's list to the ball. 14 males. Sonnets have 14 lines. Romeo's kiss to Juliet is between the 13th and the 14th line that he speaks to her. The play begins on July the 14th, a fortnight and three days before Lammas Day, and concludes 13 days short of Juliet's 14th birthday. There is a major event in the play that occurs every 14 hours, beginning with Romeo meeting Juliet, then 14 hours later, they're married 14 hours later, something else happens, and this goes on and on and on until they're dead. Well, 
I hope that satisfied the most hardcore nerds in literature to, because somebody had to find that information. On, and I don't know what's weirder that, that Shakespeare did that or that someone took the time to figure all that out. I mean, but, but what does it mean? I have no idea what it means. I've read articles saying it reflects an indictment of her age. Some people say it's a reflection on the form of the sonnet, which gives it an emphasis on true love. But like I said, I think it's just Shakespeare showing off. Look what I can do. Yeah. <laughs> but who knows? One thing that I think we can say for sure, and I really do think this, is Shakespeare clearly loves Juliet. And she is at the heart of this play way more than Romeo. And I find that sweet because I like Juliet. And I don't say that by about a lot of <laughs> Shakespeare's women. I definitely don't like Ophelia from Hamlet. I don't like either one of the Julius Caesar ladies, as you probably could tell when we read that play. They're weak, but Juliet is not. And that brings us to our starting point, because when we open up scene three, we don't see Juliet. We finished the last last episode with a strong Juliet, but we're going to open up today with this dweeby, noodle-brained Romeo. He's hiding in Friar Lawrence's cell, and Friar Lawrence is trying to explain to him that banishment isn't the end of the world. He can stay there for a bit, let the whole thing blow over, let the marriage come out, and they'll get things sorted. Of course, there is a bit of foreshadowing in the lines, Romeo, affliction is enamored in thy parts, and thou art wedded to calamity. <laughs> but <laughs> that goes over everyone's head at the time. <laughs> mm. Well, uh, I will say Romeo is a bit dramatic with the whole, uh, I'm going to pull out my sword and kill myself routine. And he says, tell me, friar, in what vile part of this anatomy doth my name lodge? Tell me that I may sack the hateful mansion. <laughs> No, uh, but the priest does know how to cheer him up. Happiness courts thee in her best array, but like a misshaven and sullen wench, thou poutest upon thy fortune and thy love. Take heed, take heed, for such die miserable. Go, get thee to thy love, as we decreed. Ascend chamber hence and comfort her. There's a euphemism for you. But look, thou... Stay not till the watch be set, for then thou can't not pass to Mantua. So you got well, your one night, and then you got to get out. <laughs> hmm. uh, which, by the way, in, in any case, if anyone is wondering, Mantua is only about 20 miles away, which is not a dis disastrous distance and uh, de definitely not an infinite distance. And, no. <laughs> but you couldn't tell by Romeo's reaction. It, it does seem, though, that um, a quick stop at Juliet's is enough to help him get over the edge of his despair. <laughs> he replies, after all the whining, how well my comfort is revived by this. And so he seems to be cheered up. He's been revived. <laughs> well, which is more than we can say for sweet Juliet. She really is in trouble. Ironically, this is dramatic irony. We, the audience, know that way more uh, than she does. Her father has had a sudden change of mind. Not only is she going to be forced to marry Paris against her will, which if you remember, initially he was not going to do that, but he's going to do it on Thursday. And then he goes, well, I would do it Thursday, Wednesday, but that's rushing things. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. 24 hours makes it yes, appropriate. Yes, it does. Well, true. I, I'd say Juliet is unaware. Uh, when we see Juliet, she's in the throes of love and this is the scene everyone remembers from uh, watching the movie in the school, the the brief nudity. <laughs> back when such things didn't happen. That's back when that kind of thing was not done. What year was that made? In the 60s? Well, I didn't see it in the 60s, obviously, but... <laughs> I, I just said you were... You had to be there for it. You know, they still have it around. I know. I remember, though, showing this movie in class with a VCR, and I would be very strategic about fast-forwarding, horrified that the principal would walk in at the quite scandalous moment. Mm. Well, this scene is such a contrast. I mean, you have the passionate goodbye of the lovers and then this really um, abrupt cruelty of her dad. I know. And I do want to talk a lot about these daddy issues. But before, I want to talk about the birds. Hmm. They're so important. The lark is the bird that sings in the morning, apparently. Uh, and a nightingale is a bird that sings at night. Again, City Girl Hill wouldn't be able to know that. But, <laughs> but anyway, Romeo and Juliet hear birds, and Juliet is bemoaning the fact that Romeo has to go. I will say again, we see that Juliet 
has to be the practical one. Romeo does all this, let me be taken, let me be put to death. I'm not sure he really means that, but maybe he does. Let's look at the passage and kind of read it out. So I guess you're saying Romeo is the more dramatic of the two. (laughs) I find him to be. (laughs) All right, well, I'll read his lines. Let me be taken, let me be put to death. I'm content, so thou wilt have it so. I'll say yon gray is not the morning's eye. Tis but the pale reflex of Cynthia's brow. Nor that is not the lark whose notes do beat. The vaulty heaven so high above our heads, I have more care to say than will to go. Come death and welcome. Juliet wills it so. How is it, my soul? Let's talk. It is not day. It is. It is. High hence, be gone away. It is the lark that sings so out of tune, straining harsh discords and unpleasing sharps. Some say the lark makes sweet division. This doth not so, for she divideth us. Some say the lark and loathed toad changed eyes. Oh, now I would they have changed voices too, since arm from arm that voice doth us affray. Hunting thee hence, with hunts up to the day. Oh, now be gone. More light and light it grows. More light and light, more dark and dark our woes. Again, we see light, light, dark, dark. I've talked about all the contrasts in this play, starting with light and dark, but then life and death. But I want to take a minute to think about just a little bit more. There's so many contrasts, and they're obvious, and they're large in this play. We have Juliet versus Romeo, Montague versus Capulet, male versus female, sexual violence versus sexual affection, love versus hate, age versus youth, tragedy versus comedy, reality versus dreams, public life versus private life. This is a play of foils, of contrasts, of extremes. Think about the characters. There's just so many pairs. Benvolio versus Tybalt. Juliet has two moms. Juliet has two lovers. The contrasts are so stark, and we're just getting ready to hit a big one. There really is something to notice here. And when you think back to the prologue, he sets this up. I told you authors do this always in their first lines. Two households, both alike in dignity. Then later it says, from forth the, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. I'll comment more on that later. But it's something to think about as we move forward towards the fast-approaching, fast-paced end of the play. The doubles are not just in the contrast. There's doubles everywhere. And if you've noticed, we even read doubles. They're in the actual words. He keeps repeating things like more light, more light, more dark, more dark all the time. Well, between the numerology and the contrast, <laughs> he is showing off. He's, it's hard to cram that much into a, a short story. But uh, but why are there so many doubles? Why so many twos? Why so many contrasts? Why is that a thing? I know. Well, you know, I think it's a little bit more deep or more thematic oriented than just the numerology, which I think might be kind of silly. But we see it in the famous last words here again. Uh, And I do want us to read the last words that Romeo and Juliet say to each other as he gets ready to leave. They're sad for their own sake. Romeo, and you can visualize this in your mind, he's climbed down the rope and he's looking up and she's looking down from the balcony. All this foreshadowing. (laughs) And then this line, Oh God, I have an ill-divining soul Methinks I see thee, now thou art so low as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Either my eyesight fails, or thou lookest pale. And trust me, love, in my eyes so do you. Dry blood drinks our blood. Adieu, adieu. Oh. <laughs> the first word Juliet says after Romeo leaves is again in pairs. And the last word that he said was in pairs. Oh, fortune, fortune, all men call thee fickle. If thou art fickle, what dost thou with him that is renowned for faith? Be fickle, fortune, for then I hope thou will not keep him long, but send him back. She's talking about fortune bringing Romeo back to her, but there's a lot of duality here. Look at all the alliteration and the repetition. In fact, and this is really going to get into that 
nerdy scholarship. <laughs> it's thing all right. Again. Shakespearean nerds appreciate it. I know, it. but there's this guy named Robert Watson, and he did this. He ran the stats on this. One percent of the words in this play are actually in pairs like this. These double words are just all over the place. And then if you combine that with all the oxymorons, we've pointed out some of those, and the contrast, there is no Shakespearean play that even comes close to having as many doubles or contrasts is this one. And it's something to notice, it's something to think about, it's something to think, you know, Shakespeare never speaks in cliches. So when he's leading us somewhere, we have to wonder where he's taking us with all these, not just double words, but with duplicitous talk and double meaning and even a double life. Let's read these lines that change the story for Juliet. So Romeo has left and the mom comes in. I'll read Juliet and you read the mom and see all the double speak here. The deliberate deception. Her mom thinks she's wailing and crying about Tybalt, but it's ironic. We know as readers, we know it's all fake. It's duplicitous, but it's mysterious why he writes this way. Something to wonder, wonder about. <laughs> Well, shall we read? Shall we read? We shall. We shall. How about Act 3, Scene 5? I'll read Juliet if you'll read the mom. Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> Ho, daughter, are you up? Who is it that calls? Is it my lady mother? Is she not down so late or up so early? What unaccustomed cause procures her hither? Why, how now, Juliet? Madam, I am not well. Evermore weeping for your cousin's death? What, wilt thou wash him from his grave with tears? And if thou couldst, thou couldst not make him live. Therefore, have done. Some grief shows much of love, but much of grief shows still some want of wit. Yet let me weep for such a feeling loss. So shall you feel the loss, but not the friend which you weep for. Feeling so the loss, I cannot choose but ever weep the friend. Well, girl, thou weepest not so much for his death, as that the villain lives which slaughtered him. What villain, madam? That same villain, Romeo. And then she says this to the side. Villain and he be many miles asunder. God pardon him. I do with all my heart, and yet no man like he doth grieve my heart. In other words, no man but Romeo grieves my heart. She means it one way, but her mother takes it mm. another that is because the traitor murderer lives. I, madam, from the reach of these hands, with none but I might venge my cousin's death. <laughs> we will have vengeance for it, fear thou not. Then weep no more. I'll send to one in Mantua, where that same banished runagate doth live, shall give him such an unaccustomed dram that he shall soon keep Tybalt company, and then I hope thou wilt be satisfied." Indeed, I shall n never be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him. Dead is my poor heart, so for a kinsman vexed. Madam, if you could find out but a man to bear a poison, I would temper it, that Romeo should, upon receipt thereof, soon sleep in quiet. Oh, how my heart abhors to hear him named and cannot come to him. To wreck the love I bore my cousin upon his body that has slaughtered him. Oh, my. How can her mother misinterpret that? But <laughs> she does. <laughs> uh, and then when the dad comes in, it goes from bad to worse because her mother is just a little bit scolding. But she goes on to say that she's not going to want to marry Paris. And then it gets really dark. Let's read those lines. You read the dad and I'll read Juliet. Soft, take me with you, take me with you, wife. How will she none? Doth she not give us thanks? Is she not proud? Doth she not count her blessed? Unworthy as she is that we have wrought so worthy a gentleman to be her bridegroom. Not proud you have, but thankful that you have. Proud can I never be of what I hate, but thankful even for the hate that is meant for love. How, 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 how? Chop logic, what is this? 
proud and I thank you and I thank you not. And yet not proud, Mistress Minion, you thank me, no thankings, nor proud me, no prouds. But fettle your fine joints against Thursday next to go with Paris to St. Peter's Church. Or will I drag thee on a hurdle thither out, you green sickness carrion out, you baggage, you tallow face? Fie, fie. What are you, mad? That's what the wife says. But then Juliet says, Good father, I beseech you on my knees. Hear me with patience, but to speak a word. Hang thee, young baggage, disobedient wretch. I tell thee what, get thee to church on Thursday, or never after look me in the face. Speak not, reply not, do not answer me. My fingers itch. Wife, we scarce thought us blessed that God had lent us but this only child. But now I see this one is one too much. And what we have, a curse in having her out on her, Hilding. Well, and Hilding, for those of us who don't speak Middle English or whatever, yeah. is means you good for nothing. Wow. It's mean. Well, the language is abusive. I mean, uh, it's extreme and just really unjustified. And what has changed that merits such an about face? I mean, why such haste? Why... Such impulsivity uh, that makes a man talk to his young daughter with such rage and violence. And it is rageful. Yes, and Romeo and Juliet are talking stars and fate. But we see here it's really character, not fate, that's pushing people to extremes. Uh, you, you talked in the beginning about adults not acting like adults and that being uh, the whole problem with this community in Verona. And I think the argument could be made that um, poor impulse control, and something that is considered a childish trait, is really the villain here. Uh, the dad has abandoned his daughter. The mother has abandoned her daughter. And finally, even the nurse has abandoned Juliet. And Romeo has waltzed off and left her. Juliet is totally alone at this point in a play. And I can't think of a way for a young teenage girl to be more isolated than this. I like the way you phrase that because that's another thing that's really unusual about this play. There, There is no villain. Not really. In literature, we think of conflicts in terms of man versus man, like an external conflict. But we've killed off Tybalt. Uh, the only human antagonist that was really stirring things up. So then we say, well, maybe it's man versus himself. And you can say that, you know, and I've kind of made a little bit of fun of Romeo for being so extreme, m maybe even hapless at times. And I'm not sure I would want, you know, my daughter's getting involved <laughs> with Romeo, but he's definitely not a villain. And the things that he does are understandable. Who is the villain? Is it the father? I, I don't know. Is it fate itself? The prologue hints that it's faith, but it also hints that the antagonist is something else and that it's just being disguised as fate. There's always been one line in the prologue that has bothered me. And I know I keep referring back to the prologue, uh, but like I've told you before, and I really get into this in the first episode of The Scarlet Letter, if you want to hear that lesson, but I contend that authors really try to tell you something important in the first line or two of the play, and that's undoubtedly true uh, in this one. But the final line of that initial sonnet is this, which, but their children's end, not could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage, with which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. What's bothered me about those lines is that the idea that you could do this play in two hours. <laughs> I can't even teach it in a month. It's not possible to do this play in an hour. Now, I know that Elizabethan people were more auditory and probably they were talking faster and they didn't have intermissions, but I just have never conceived how it could be possible to do this play in an hour. And then I heard this one guy say, well, maybe it's not supposed to be two hours. Maybe it's kind of a metaphor for something. And that makes sense to me. This play is about rushing through things. It's about rushing through decisions. It's about impulsivity. And he says, patient irritants, you'll understand. And maybe there's something there. Well, uh, Romeo and Juliet are rash and they are impulsive. Uh, that's understandable, really. I mean, they're teenagers and they're beautiful and in love and in lust and whatever you want 
want to call it, and uh, it, it makes sense and it doesn't hurt anyway. But in, in fact, who are we to judge passion when it's an expression of youthful idealism? I mean, we've glorified that all through the ages. Oh, that's one of the great things about being young, uh, and you aren't jetted yet. And it reminds <laughs> me of the, the classic cliche that it's too bad that youth is wasted on the young. Well, and it's just what's so fun about being loved, and it's fun what we love about you know, young movies. That's all true. But when you think about the adults, they're also so impulsive. I mean, why is Friar Lawrence marrying them? Then Capulet rushing off to marry his daughter. Then Friar Lawrence, again, coming up with this strange and very impulsive solution. With each impulsive decision, we see things escalate. And they're going to escalate to the place that they get out of control. In Act 4, Juliet reveals to the friar that she is going to be forced to marry Paris. Uh, He's empathetic, but she's very emphatic that this is not going to happen. She says this, Oh, bid me leap rather than marry Paris from off the battlements of any tower or walk in thievish ways. Or bid me lurk where serpents are. Chain me with roaring bears. Hide me nightly in a charter house or covered quite with dead men's rattling bones with reeky shanks and yellow chopless skulls or bid me go into a new made grave and hide me with a dead man in his tomb. Things that to hear them told have made me tremble. I will do it without fear or doubt to live an unstained wife to my sweet love. Hmm. Well, that's that's <laughs> commitment. I think she's making I a know. point. Uh, I say she's made her point. You know, my favorite line is, chain me with the roaring bears. <laughs> Just the image. It's a little dramatic. It is, but I don't know if it's any better than the yellow chopless skulls that she has to get covered up with. Oh, goodness. Well, I, um, I guess I get the impression she doesn't like Paris. Can we assume that? I think she's made her point. <laughs> yes. And, of course, the friar comes up with a strange plan to drink poison that will make her look dead for 24 hours. This is such a cockamamie plan. I think you need to read it. Hold then. Go home. Be merry. Give consent to marry Paris. Wednesday is tomorrow. Tomorrow night, look that thou lie alone. Let not thy nurse lie with thee in thy chamber. Take thou this vial, being then in bed, and this distilled liquor drink thou off. When presently through all of thy veins shall run a cold and drowsy humor, for no pulse shall keep his native progress but surcrease. No warmth, no breath shall testify thou livest. The roses in thy lips and cheeks shall fade to paley ashes. Thy eyes' windows fall like death when he puts up the day of life. Each part deprived of supple government shall stiff and stark and cold appear like death. And in this borrowed likeness of shrunk death, thou shalt continue two and forty hours, and then awake as from a pleasant sleep. Now when the bridegroom in the morning comes to rouse thee from thy bed, there art thou dead. Then as the manner of our country is in thy best robes uncovered on the bier, thou shalt be born to that same ancient vault where all the kindred of the Capulets lie. In the meantime, Against thou shalt awake. Shall Romeo by my letters know our drift, and hither shall he come, and he and I will watch by waking, and that very night shall Romeo bear thee hence to Mantua, and this shall free thee from this present shame. If no inconstant toy nor womanish fear abate thy valor in the acting of it. Well, first of all, these lines are ridiculous. They kind of make me mad. At the friar. You know, I've been tinkering with being angry at him the whole play. I don't think tinkering's a good word. (laughs) But this line, if no inconstant toy, no womanish fear abate thy valor in the acting it. First of all, he says, well, if you're too much of a woman and can't do it. Well, he's the coward. (laughs) I mean, why doesn't he just take her to Mantua himself? She's standing right there. But instead... She trusts him, and she agrees. She tragically says, Love, give me strength, and strength shall help afford. Farewell, dear father. She trusts him, and from my perspective, she is betrayed by them all. I'm even going to say she's a little bit betrayed by Romeo, although... I hate to hate on him too much because he's trusting the friar too, but I wish he'd stayed back or at least done a little bit better by her. 
But Juliet leaves the presence of the friar, goes back home, carries on these phony conversations with her parents, telling everyone exactly what they want to hear. She sells it, but then she goes into her room all by herself and drinks this poison. Uh, You know how when we did uh, Kafka, you got caught up in Kafka's world and couldn't get out? That's what Shakespeare has done right here. I mean, there could have been logical ways to uh, fix the problem, but that's not what he wanted to do. And so I cannot imagine putting any more pressure on a little girl, never mind that she's a teenager child, just being introduced to love for the first time, something that would be overwhelming and exhausting for anyone at any time. And, and Shakespeare doesn't let up on her. I mean, Tybalt is killed and sex with Romeo, getting screamed at by her parents, running to the priest to be confronted by a man who thinks he's marrying her in a couple of days and being given poison to drink by a man that she trusts. And then going back to face everyone. And uh, when she finally perceives that she must act alone, she faces her own fears braver than I think uh, a lot of adults would do. And uh, what a soliloquy we are about to hear as Shakespeare takes us into Juliet's mind. I know. And I, I don't think we can overemphasize this. I mean, Friar Lawrence's plan is that she drink this potion, allow herself to be buried alive in a vault, the kind that they have in Italy or New Orleans, if you've seen the vampire show, the originals, that's where all the riches congregate. But anyway, the plan is she's going to be taken there and then she's going to wake up with all of her dead relatives. She's going to trust that Friar Lawrence is going to tell someone who's going to go tell Romeo where to go to find her and get her so when she wakes up in the tomb, he'll be there. That's the plan. That (laughs) is without a doubt the most ignorant and terrifying plan I have ever thought of. I mean, (laughs) or heard of. Wow. Well, here's her thoughts, and I want to end on this soliloquy because it's beautiful, actually. She says this. You know, she's told everyone to leave. She's by herself, and she says, Farewell. God knows when we shall meet again. I have a faint, cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heart of life. I'll call them back again to comfort me. Nurse, what should she do here? My dismal scene, I needs must act alone. Come, vile. What if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? No, no, this shall forbid it. Lie there, there. And she picks up a dagger and puts it next to her. What if it be a poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he should be dishonored, because he married me before to Romeo? I fear it is, and yet methinks it should not, for he hath been a tried holy man. How if when I am laid into the tomb I wake before the time that Romeo come to redeem me? There is a fearful point. Should I not then be stifled in the vault to whose foul mouth no healthsome air breathes in and there die strangled ere my Romeo comes? Or, and if I live, is it not very like the horrible conceit of death and night together with the terror of the place as in a vault an ancient receptacle where for these many hundred years the bones of all my buried ancestors are packed? Where bloody Tybalt, yet but green in earth, lies festering in his shroud. Where, as they say, at some hours in the night, spirits resort. Alack, alack, is it not like that I, so early waking with what loathsome smells and shrieks like mandrakes torn out of the earth, then living mortals hearing them run mad? Or if I wake, shall I not be distraught? environed with all these hideous fears and madly play with my forefather's joints and pluck that mangled Tybalt from his shroud and thus enraged with some great kinsman bone with a club dash out my desperate brains. Oh, look, methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Stay, Tybalt, stay. Romeo, 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 here's drink. I drink to thee. Wow. 
Uh, it sounds like she's not really sold on the plan a little bit. Well, she and, sees the problem. She's been very logical the whole <laughs> yeah, way can, through. Well, and, and I, I'd say this fails the say out loud test. Now, the say out loud test means you have a thought and you think it's a good thought in your mind, but the moment you say it out loud, you realize <laughs> that's not a good thought. And so, if you say this out loud, uh, you'll talk yourself out of it, I think. But and yet she says it out loud. She thinks at the end, I could be crazy and bust my own brains out and yet she drinks she does it not because she doesn't understand she does it because she's desperate she takes the only risk that she sees she can it's the only hope that she can find but of course we the audience are forced to ask this question is this really <laughs> your only option <laughs> All this double talk, double speech, all the rushing, all this impulsiveness. Isn't this a little bit too much? Well, I mean, we can't know the answer to that question by the end of Act 4. Uh, as you might expect from such a concocted plan, the end of Act 4 is total chaos. And so far, all is going to plan. When a family finds Juliet, they are all regret what they did. The nurse, her mom, her dad, lots of repetition. Look, look, help, help. She's dead. She's dead. Oh, woeful. Oh, woeful. Woeful day. To murder, to murder. Our seminity. Oh, child. Oh, child. And then we saw another weird contrast, as uh, Capulet pronounces. All things that we ordained festival turned from their office to black funeral. Our instruments to melancholy bells. Our wedding cheer to a sad burial feast. Our solemn hymns to sullen dirges change. Our bridal flowers serve for a buried corpse, and all things change them to the contrary. Yes, because they were planning a wedding, and when mm -hmm. they walk in, she's dead. Now they have a funeral, and of course the preacher's there. Right. It, well, of course, Fr Friar Lawrence, uh, who knows all of this is a fake, says all these very comforting but cliched lines. And heaven in yourself had part in his fair maid. Now heaven hath all, and all the better it is for the maid. Sort of like, well, you know, she's in a better place. She's fine. Friar Lawrence, that guy. I mean, he's not a bad person. For sure, but he's just so dang irresponsible. But I will say, as much as he acts irresponsibly, he knows better. And I do think he does give great advice, even way back in Act 2, when he says, Therefore, love moderately. Long love doth so. Too swift arrives, as tardy as too slow. And then again he says, Wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. Next week, we're going to see more stumbling and more running, nothing moderate, as we get to the tragic conclusion of everyone's favorite doomsday love story. Doomsday <laughs> love story. That's the subtitle, apparently. Okay. Well, thanks for being with us today. Uh, make sure you follow us on uh, our Instagram page and on our Facebook page. That we post all kinds of information there. Also, check out our How to Love Lit podcast page. You have access to all of the episodes that we have done, which are quite a few by now. You have teaching materials. Uh, you can even check out some of the comments that we're getting from listeners that we really, truly appreciate. Thanks for being with us. Peace out. Peace out.